Praise God. So today I want to talk a little bit uh, about breaking the hold of condemnation. I want to talk about breaking the hold of condemnation by the power of agreements, right? And this is going to make sense, please God, right? Uh, in other words, I want to talk about breaking the hold that shame can have, breaking the hold that guilt can have, breaking that, that hold that this sense that I've done wrong by God and I'm therefore separated from Him, that that can have on our lives by the power of agreeing with the Word of God. Does that make sense? So to distill that down again, when we start to agree with God about what He said and about what He's done, God starts to, we start to see the chains fall off. Chains of shame fall off, fear, doubt. It starts to melt away when we start to get on page with what the Lord has said. Amen. And I'm going to pull apart some scriptures uh, tonight, hopefully. Um, so I'm going to start in Proverbs 17, verse 15. And I want to talk. Um, yeah, let's read it. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. It's interesting, right? So the writer uses two words there that I want to really look at. The first one is justifies and the second one is condemns. And that word um, justify in the Hebrew is sodak. It means to declare righteous, right? To declare righteous, okay? So to justify is to declare righteous or to speak a word of righteousness or a judge. The way that a judge bangs the gavel, boom, boom, and says this person is innocent or this person is guilty. Justification, the Bible uses that word, right? Do you know you're familiar with the word that we're not justified by works but by faith in the work of another, right? We're aware of that, that you're not justified by your works, you're not justified what you can do before God. Rather, you're justified by your faith and the work of Jesus Christ. What He has done when He gave His life, when He shed His blood for sinners, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, when He was buried in the grave and when He rose on the third day. When you put your faith in that, the Bible says you receive the righteousness of Christ. Not your own righteousness that you offer to God, but the righteousness from God given to you by faith, from faith to faith. That's what the Bible teaches. So that word justify or justifies, this word, it's the same word. So that word in the New Testament in the Greek, it's the same word here, who justifies the wicked and who condemns. That word condemn is also, it also means a declaration or to declare wrong or to declare unclean. So there are these two declarations that the uh, writer in Proverbs is describing. And to declare what is guilty, or to speak guilt over that which is innocent, or to speak innocence over that which is guilty, are both an abomination to God. So this idea of declarations or declaring or speaking guilt where there's innocence or innocence where there's guilt, both are an abomination to the Lord. In other words, declarations matter. It matters. What God has said about you matters. Amen. It's true. What God has said about you matters. Too often we're too quick to hear and, and, and to believe the word of the devil and even the word of our own hearts over the word of God and what he said about us. Declarations matter. God has declared us righteous. You have been justified. Amen? We are justified. What proceeds out of the mouth, uh, we, we have been justified by God. But we need to understand something here, and I'm going somewhere with this. When, when, um, uh, what proceeds out of the mouth, what we say then, has the power to defile the conscience as well. So, in other words, when we walk, what we say, what comes out of our mouth, has got the power to do something to our conscience and deal with our insides. In other words, do you ever meet somebody walking or who walks around and says, you know, I'm always sad, I'm sad, or nothing's going well? You ever meet a negative person, somebody who's super negative? Do you, notice how that, do you notice how when you're done talking to that negative person, you feel negative, right? And when you're in a negative place, you tend to speak negativity and that breeds more negativity internally. That's what I'm talking about, that your declarations, the things that you say, 
the things that you choose to dwell on, set your mind on, have an internal effect on your life, okay? Jesus says in Matthew 15, 16, do you not understand? Do you not yet realize that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then is eliminated? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these things defile a man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, and false testimony. False testimony, okay? For out of the heart come evil thoughts, da 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 da, verse 20. These are what defile a man, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile him. So I want to look at this idea that Jesus is saying that out of the heart, man can bear false testimony out of his mouth okay? The danger of the wrong story, in other words. A false testimony is a wrong story or a false account, okay? That's what a false testimony is. It's a false account. It's not the truth. And the, Jesus is saying that this comes out of your heart, out of your mouth, and has the power then to go back and defile you again or further. And we need to be careful about wrong narratives as believers, right? We need to be careful about the things that we say, the things that, the, the things that we allow to take root in our lives as believers, okay? Uh, the wrong narratives that are contrary to what the, what the gospel has declared over you and declared over me, okay? So what he's declared over us and what we choose to believe about ourselves can be two different things. I want to move on to Colossians 3.13 here. Listen to what Paul is saying. The Apostle Paul, uh, he's reminding the Colossians, reminding them of the truth. When you start to read these epistles, these Pauline letters, Paul often spends his time reestablishing truth to the audiences that he's speaking to. Paul understood that it's easy, the human nature, it's human nature to take your eyes off truth and begin to become, to, to become consumed with, with false testimony and false narratives. And we get lost in these wrong stories all the time. And so Paul says this in Colossians 3.13, And you who are dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God has made a life together with him. Paul had to bring a reminder to the Colossians. Don't you forget that you were dead in your trespasses, you were dead in your sins, dead in the uncircumcision of your flesh, but God has made you alive in Him, in Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. That is justification, okay? Don't forget that you've been justified. Yes, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins, but you've been forgiven, you've been justified, amen? By cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. We're going to get into all of this. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Okay, so Paul is saying, don't forget you've been justified and every, every accusation has been put down. There is now no condemnation, no separation in Christ. Okay, observances uh, or, or, or uh, obedience, observance, it can't bring you any closer nor can it pull you further away. We've been brought near by the blood. What can separate us from the love of God? Look at Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. Neither has value. All that matters is faith expressed in love. So Paul is writing to the Galatian church and he's saying, in this church you've got people who, who obey circumcision and people who don't obey circumcision. But Paul is saying, don't you understand, in Christ neither of those things matter anymore. So one can't say to the other that I can boast, I can boast in my circumcision. So the person can and say, well, I'm doing this right and you're doing this wrong. So this idea of judgment dies in Christ because we're all coming the same way, amen, by faith in Christ. We're all coming the same way to the cross. We're all coming the same way to God. And so judgment is excluded and boasting is excluded. There is a reality, though, uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's just, it is a reality that when we walk with God, when we, um, ex when, we, when we are on the road for any point in time, there is a reality that there is a warring, uh, an internal warring. There are two 
opposing courts, really, of, of, of truth um, that, that we need to be aware of and we need to know that God is leading us uh, to a better place. Uh, you know, there's, there's the verdict that can come from our hearts. First John 3 uh, says this, verse 20, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. So there's a reality that our hearts can condemn us on this journey with Christ, that even on this journey with God, even in light of these phenomenal truths, the truths that God bears out in his word, that we've been justified, that there's nobody, that, that, that we're, we're the righteousness of God. There's a real condemnation that can happen. We can, we, can, we can feel things that aren't necessarily the truth, okay? And these, this condemnation brings a verdict. Uh, it, it can speak to to, to guilt where there's innocence. In other words, when the, the, the writer of Proverbs says it's an abomination to justify, to, to condemn the righteous, you've got to make sure that you're not condemning yourself. You've got to make sure that you're not condemning yourself. The word says that's an abomination to the Lord, that you would, you would speak over yourself a verdict other than the one God has spoken over you. That's an abomination to the Lord that that's not the heart of God, that it's not okay for us to carry around these narratives, these stories, these ideas about ourselves that are not in step or in line with what the gospel says about us, that it is not, it is not the heart of God or the plan of God. And so there are these almost two courts of courts of, of truth, that we've got our internal court where our heart speaks one thing, and we've got the truth of the gospel and the voice of God that speaks another. But it's the heart of God that we would, we would not put any court of truth above what the Word of God says about us, okay? Uh, verse 21, verse, uh, uh, 1 John 3, 21, Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and we will receive uh, in Him whatever we ask because we keep His commandments to do what is pleasing in His sight. That there is a reality that our hearts can condemn us, but God is greater than our hearts. Amen. He's greater than our hearts. Romans 8, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I'm going to start up there and I want to talk a little bit um, a little bit more just about accusation here uh, if you'll just bear with me please do not know I'll just press through here I'm going to talk about John but let's go to John 8 um, and I want to talk about a woman I want to talk about a woman here because the, I think that there's a picture in the scriptures that can teach this maybe a little bit better for us uh, and it's a woman the Bible says she was caught in adultery she was caught in adultery, and what's funny is there was no uh, uh, conversation about a man. Uh, she was caught in the act of adultery, yet rather than dragging the man out for public shame, they just drag the woman out. They just drag her out, and she's drug, drug and she's brought before Jesus. And um, let me just start reading here. Uh, John 8, 2, at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away at one time, the older first until Jesus was left. Only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then Jesus, listen to this. Jesus said, Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. I want to talk a little bit about accusation. I want to talk about accusation. I want to talk about that voice that we can all deal with in the Christian walk, that voice that speaks a different verdict other than the one that the Word of God speaks over us. We deal with accusations as believers. When we walk this journey, we feel it. You didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. You didn't do this. You should have done that. These accusations are a reality. And, and, and there's a picture here uh, of a woman who's brought before her accusers. 
I need you to see this because sometimes we can just read these passages and read these instances and miss some of the, the temperature of them. These, this was a rabid horde of men who had dragged a woman out of a bed where she was in, the, in, in an act of adultery and they'd brought her into a public setting and they'd cast her before Jesus. And these men came requiring what the law prescribed, that she would be stoned to death for her adultery. So that legal, remember Colossians spoke about the code of legal requirements, right? Colossians teaches about that, that there's a code of legal requirements. And they came with this moral code, the code of Moses, the law of Moses, and they said, this woman, according to the law, according to that external code, deserves death for, because she's guilty of adultery, right? She's guilty of adultery. And what's Jesus' response because we, we, we are, are, you know, Paul, Paul bears this out in Romans 7. I know what, what I want to do, but I find another law working in my members, leading me to do things that I hate. We don't have an issue knowing what's right, but there are times where we struggle to, 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 eat, to do it or not do it, and then the, ac the accusations come in. What kind of Christian are you? kind of Christian are you to do that, to, to, not do, to do this, to not do that? So here come the accusations. And Jesus' response to the law that required death for sin was to bring a higher law of the Spirit that said, let the one who was the first, who's, who's, who, uh, let, let, let the, the, the first guiltless one cast the first stone. There's another law at work that we need to begin to walk and step in, and it's the law of the Spirit, okay? No accusation can stand because, because there's no longer an accuser left to bring the accusation. The Pharisees came to Jesus seeking the price of adultery that the law prescribed. The law demanded condemnation. The law demanded condemnation. For you, for me, that accusing voice will always demand condemnation, will always speak of separation from you and God, will always speak of reproach, will always speak into shame, will always speak those things over you. And so when that accusation comes, when that accusation begins to speak in your heart, there is a choice, and, and, and the choice is to see Jesus it's to see Jesus. It's to see Jesus not standing with the crowd to throw a stone, but standing between the crowd and, and the woman or between, between the, the, what the law prescribes and us saying, uh, 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 saying, speaking of better things. Amen? Speaking of better things. Romans 8.31, what shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, freely give us all things? Verse 33, listen to this. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. That's that word again. Who will bring an accusation against God's elect? Who will speak a verdict over God's people? It's God who's, because it's God who's spoken or justified or brought the verdict. Who is there to condemn us? For Christ Jesus who died and more than that was raised to life is at the right hand of God and he is interceding for us. Word again, justifying. It's a declaration, a pronouncement of one being just or righteous. Who are we to bring a charge even against ourselves or another when he has ruled in our favor? He has ruled in our favor. He has spoken something, and yet we come and bring a charge even against ourselves. Who can make a declaration over us? Who can bring any accusation or charge? Our innocence has been declared by God himself. There is no higher court where you can be tried and found guilty. There's no higher court, there's no place, there's no word, there's no verdict that can supersede the word that God has spoken over your life. We must not bring a charge of unrighteousness, an accusation against ourselves to declare guilt where God has declared innocence. What God has called clean, let us not call unclean. Amen? Remember that instance from Acts chapter 10, right? Peter is on the roof of Simon the Tanner. 
he's praying and he sees a vision of unclean animals coming down on a cloth. And he sees this vision. As a Jew, Peter would have had strict dietary laws. And so God speaks. There's a word from heaven that says, go, Peter, hunt and eat. And Peter's response is, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. To which God says, don't call unclean what I've called clean. That very day, Peter finds himself in the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, speaking the word of God, bringing the gospel, and God shows up, fills that house of Gentiles, those who don't observe, those who don't observe, and they're filled with the Spirit of God. They're filled with God. And so there's this call in Scriptures to agree with God, to agree with the verdict of God. What God has said, I'm going to agree with that. I'm going to quiet any other voice. I'm going to quiet any, and look, look, look at Jesus. Jesus has to put out the accuser. Amen? He's to put the, out, out the accuser. The way that he put out that crowd of, of Pharisees, he sent them packing. He had to put out the accuser. I'm going to show you where that bears out in Scripture again here uh, in just a second. But I want to just say again, the gospel is the highest court of truth. There is no appeal. There's no overturning the verdict. There's no overturning it. There is no, uh, you know, uh, there's no supreme court that you can go to in the hopes to get a verdict other than what God has said. God has said, spoken a word of righteousness, that you and that I are the righteousness of God, that the blood of Jesus has done what the blood of bulls and goats could not. What the blood of Jesus has done, what the law could not, having been weakened by the flesh. And so God took the law and took the flesh and nailed it to the cross. That's what the book of Colossians teaches us, that he took the written ordinances, took that law, took that standard that we couldn't meet, took that standard that those Pharisees pointed to uh, about that woman, and he nailed it to the cross, doing away with it. There's no, there's no accusation left. Where are your accusers, woman? Where are your accusers? Where are the ones who would speak another word over you? Other than the word I've spoken, they're gone. Therefore, I, conde I don't condemn you either. I don't condemn you either because I've put the accusers out of the temple. Amen? The temple of our hearts, of our lives. Our body is the temple. I've put the accusers out of the temple. And we're not, we're not to call unclean what God has called clean. We're not to walk around with that false narrative, that false verdict over our heads. The Bible says that his banner over us is love. Amen. But I want to look a little bit more at this putting out of the accuser, and I want to look at the way that we, the, the, we deal with accusation, and then I'm finished. Uh, I'm going to go to Revelations chapter 12. Uh, commentators would dispute as to whether this is a story in the future or one actually uh, concerning uh, past things. I believe it's something that has happened already. Uh, uh, I'm just going to read it out here, and then we're going to pull it apart. Verse 7, then a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But the dragon was not strong enough, and no longer was any place found in heaven for him and his angels. And the dr great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was hurled down to earth, and his angels with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven cry. Actually, no, I'll stop there, and I'll go down here. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to a male child. And the woman was given two wings uh, of a great eagle to fly from the presence of the serpent to her place in the wilderness, where she was nourished for a time and a times and half a time. Then from the mouth of the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away in the torrent. But the earth helped the woman and opened its mouth to swallow up the river that had poured from the dragon's mouth. Verse 17, listen, and the dragon was enraged at the woman and went to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Here's this passage of scripture that's teaching something that went on in heaven. And this old serpent, this dragon, the devil, is cast down to earth, cast down in anger, knowing that his time is short. And verse 17 says, he goes to make war now, now being disbarred from heaven. 
now having no place in heaven, no place, no, no, no access to the throne, to the presence, is now cast down to earth to make war against those who believe, who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And this war, what I believe this war is, is this. It's a war of accusation. It would be to, it would be, the war would be to accuse you and me no longer before God, but before our own consciences. Do you catch what I'm saying there? Notice how in the book of Job, the Bible says that Satan appeared with the angels. God says, have you considered Job my servant? And Satan says, yes, but you know, skin for skin. If you uh, take this from him and that from him, he'll, t he'll curse you. He'll curse your name. So here is Satan in the presence of God with access to the presence to bring accusation, to bring uh, a, a, another word, another potential verdict to God. Yet the Bible says here in Revelations that it was cast out. He was cast out. And so now, since he's not welcome in the courts of heaven, he comes and brings accusations in our, in our hearts. That's the war. That's the plan of what he does, okay? His plan, has, he, Satan has got no right to stand before God and accuse the elect. Amen? He's got no, no, no uh, right to do that. So he attempts to make the court of personal conscience the highest court of truth. That's what the enemy seeks to do. Take the court of personal conscience and make it the highest court of truth to elevate our internal dialogue, to elevate our internal insecurities, fears, senses, all the way up to be the highest court of truth. Verse 10 of this passage says this, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He who accuses them day and night before God. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. This is the conquering. This is what you, me, what we can walk in as believers when accusation comes to our personal conscience to bring another verdict. The solution to accusation the solution to condemnation in the life of the Christian is simple. We must bear witness or testimony or begin to agree with the truth. That's what the word says. They conquered by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. There was an accord with truth. There was an agreeing with God. And this was the conquering. This was the breaking apart the accusations of the devil, of the evil one. The blood of Christ that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That's what it says in the book of Hebrews, that blood of Abel, the Abel that, that was shed and spoke of judgment. Uh, Cain shed his brother's blood and it called for judgment. Cain was cast out. He was judged. He was put out, put away. He was separated. Cain was condemned. That was what the blood of Abel spoke of. And yet Hebrews says, blood has been shed again, but it speaks a better word. The blood of Christ speaks of reconciliation and redemption. The blood of Jesus Christ speaks of, of, of intimacy and justification and sanctification. That the blood of Jesus means that we can be brought in and have been brought in. Our redemption, the Bible says in Colossians 1 that we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son through our redemption by his blood. The Bible says in the book of Acts that we are the church of God and we've been purchased by his blood. The Bible says that once we were aliens from the commonwealth outside of the promises and we've been brought in by the blood. God asked for blood. And God got blood. God prescribed that legal code, prescribed blood. And God got the blood that he asked for when his son shed his blood on the cross. The gospel is the highest court of truth. And there is no appeal. We are the righteousness of God. There is no accusation that can stand in his presence because the perfection of Christ stands there instead. There is perfection. There is a perfection now in heaven. There is a man in heaven. There is a representative in heaven. 
And it's a life that can't be dislodged. The Bible says that Jesus stands as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, not on the basis of bodily descent or legal requirement, but on the basis of an indestructible life. There is an indestructible, indispensable righteousness in the presence of God. Satan has no place in the presence of God to bring accusation because the blood stands forever as the fulfillment of the laws he accuses us of not following. Does that make sense? That how can he accuse us of breaking laws when Christ stands having fulfilled them all on our behalf? and we in him by faith. What accusation can you bring against Christ? What accusation can you bring against Christ? There is no accusation that can stand before the Son of God because he has perfectly fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. The Bible says in Romans 10, Christ is the end of the law or the aim of the law to those who believe, for those who believe that the power of the law to prescribe death to the guilty is gone because he lived the life we could never live and died the death we should have died. He fulfilled the law in its full in its fullness and by by nailing it to the tree there is no longer a written code that God that can be pointed to by any accuser that can condemn the righteous. Woman, where are your accusers? Woman, where are your accusers? Jesus at the cross has put out every accusation against you. So don't bring an accusation against yourself. Don't bring an accusation against yourself. That written code, that law of righteous requirements has been disbarred from the presence because the blood has satisfied the requirements of God. It's done. It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. We stand in the fulfillment of righteousness. We have a perfect, a perfect man, a perfect representative, a perfect one. And there is no condemnation, therefore, in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Because Christ did what the law could not. He brought a real righteousness for you and for me. We don't need to entertain any other verdict anymore. We don't need to entertain any other voice anymore. We overcome these accusations by the blood that speaks of better things and by the word of our testimony. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. I'm purchased. I'm justified. I'm loved. I belong to God. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm a child of God. See the love the love the Father has lavished upon us that I might be called a child of God. That is the testimony. That is our song in the night when everything is bearing down on you and you're not able to see beyond your own fear, your own insecurity, your own shame. There's a song you can sing. There's a song you can sing. There's a truth that has got nothing to do with where you're at and everything to do with where he is at. Forever in the presence. As long as he is standing before God, no accusation can stand before you. It's the power of the cross. Don't agree. Amos 3 says, how can two walk together if they don't agree? There's a growing agreement with God that the Holy Spirit would bring you into, bring me into. That his word, we would begin to accord with his word. And that's our prayer, that's my prayer, that we would, for myself even, for myself even, because so, you know, we, could, we all walk around with different narratives, different concepts about ourselves, different views of God, different views other than what he has said of himself. Yet the work of God is that faith would flow through love in our lives, that faith would be complete and perf- perfect in each and every one of us. You're not what you say you are. You're what he says you are. Amen. Amen. We sing that song, I am who you say I am. We are who he says we are. Amen. We just want to pray.
that the word finds its root in our hearts and blossoms into a life of agreement, a life where we agree. Don't let anybody bring an accusation. Who can bring accusation against God's elect? Amen. It's God who's justified you. Amen. Not Mickey Joe from down the street. God has justified you, right? Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you today that you've justified us, that we belong to you. Lord Jesus, where are our accusers? Where are the accusations now? None of them can stand. There's not a stone that can be thrown our direction, Lord Jesus, because you have fulfilled every requirement. Lord, everything is completed in you and your work. And God, I just pray tonight, Lord, we would be encouraged. We would be set free from the power of accusation. Set free, Lord, from the power of, God, condemnation and shame. We'd be set free from these feelings, Lord, that we have of separation when your blood has brought us all the way in. And Lord, since your blood has brought us in, as long as your blood is there in the, in the very holy place of God, we also have a place, Lord, in your presence, God. So we just pray tonight, Lord, that everybody here would be blessed, um, God, and set free, Lord, to walk with you in agreements in the name of Jesus. Amen.